Thank you, Nigel. That was beautiful. Yeah. Welcome, everyone, to the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House. My name is Val Hall, and I'm a member of the Lay Led Service Committee, also serving as worship team. We're still working on our title. Um, I, along with Susan Richards, Kat Robinson Greeter, and Joanne Polster, take to the pulpit once a month at least uh, to give Rev Reverend Althea time to attend her other duties off island. In a few days, winter solstice will be here, the shortest day and the longest night of the year. This service will celebrate both the solstice and the concept of reincarnation and the ways in which they relate. As a Unitarian Universalist, I'm captivated by the words of Deborah Feldman, an American-born German writer who was raised in the Hasidic Jewish tradition, but later rejected her roots, including an arranged marriage. Telling her story in the 2012 book, Unorthodox, which also was made into a Netflix series. She wrote in that book, I'd rather believe in reincarnation than hell. The idea of an afterlife is much more tolerable when returning as an option. And I'd also like to believe the words of the novelist C.R. Strahan, who wrote in her 2011 book, Lucid Dreaming, that people don't just live one life. They keep coming back until they get it right. So there you go. But before we begin, are there any announcements? First, let's start with those in Hendricks Hall. Amanda. Uh, um, if you come up a little closer so that the people on Zoom can hear, I think, how's it doing right in front of the pulpit? Just try it. I can have a loud voice if that works. <laughs> and it's short. That works. As Val said, the solstice is coming up, which also means that Nigel's birthday is coming up. So <laughs> Chalice, and as she does, please join her by reading the words printed in your order of service. It's our regular words. <laughs> Flame, we renew our commitment to justice, peace, and compassion. Now please stand as you are able to sing the affirmation written also in your order of service. It's now the time in our service where we greet one another. What? 
Um, if there's anyone new or back from a long absence who would like to tell us who you are, if so, please come to the front so everyone can hear you, including the Zoomers. Do we have anyone who would like to do that? You don't have to. But, um, is there anyone on Zoom then? No? Okay, then let's spend a few moments greeting one another in good old UU style. I know, we could do this all day. <laughs> now, Suze, if you'll come up and read your poem. Yeah, <laughs> the poem. <laughs> right. Song of the Stars by Susie Cassim. I am nothing but oxygen and hydrogen, a luminous sphere of plasma held together by helium and gravity. And like a balloon, I float on Earth, waiting to be released back into the sky, waiting to go back in the, in the reverse direction from which I came traveling through a warm tunnel of light and out into a cold, dark abyss where I will explode into a thousand pieces. I shall leave behind my body, just like the air abandons the skin of a shattered balloon. And the magnetic dust that carries my heart and spirit will lift us back to congregate and shine with the stars. Home again in the fluorescent kingdom of the constellations, I will once again be called by my soul's true name. And my heart, it will flicker again with, the, with every memory from its many lifetimes and with every wish made by a child. Thank you, Suze. Now, if you all um, stand if in spirit or uh, if you want to stand, it's up to you. Uh, for hymn number 163, uh, which is a favorite here, for the earth forever turning. We're not being heard on, if we can lower this, can we lower this more? We're not being heard on the Leah, microphone. Leah, you're, you're perfectly loud right okay. now. You can just use it as you are. Okay. Okay, so I was going to read, a, there's lots of things to celebrate. The holidays are we have Hanukkah, we've got Solstice, we've got uh, Kwanzaa coming up, and we also have Christmas. Um, I was going to read a nativity story, but... Uh, I had a special wish by a child, and it was so 
So um, I kept going for a couple days. So I have to read a little bit of the Grinch, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. We'll shorten it. We'll do, we'll do some excerpts, okay? How the Grinch Stole Christmas. For every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot. But the Grinch who lived just north of Whoville did not. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now, please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his harder shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve hating the Who's. Stound, staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm light of windows below in their town, where he knew every who down in Whoville beneath was busy now hanging a mistletoe wreath. And tomorrow, all the who girls and boys would wake bright and early. They'd rush for their toys, and then, oh, the noise, oh, the noise, 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 noise. That's one thing he hated. The noise, 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 noise. <laughs> then the Who's, young and old, would sit down to a feast, and they'd feast, and they'd feast, and they'd feast, 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 feast. And then they'd do something he liked least of all. Every Who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, would stand close together with Christmas bells ringing. They'd stand hand in hand, and the Who's would start singing. And they'd sing, and they'd sing, and they'd sing, 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 sing. Then the Grinch got an idea, an awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. I know just what to do, the Grinch laughed in his throat. He made a quick Santa Claus hat and a coat, and he chuckled and clucked. What a great Grinchy trick. With this coat and hat, I'll look just like St. Nick. Then he loaded some bags and some old empty sacks on a ramshackle sleigh, and he hitched up old Max. Then the Grinch said, giddy up, and the sleigh started down toward the homes where the Who's lay a snooze in their town. All their windows were dark, quiet snow filled the air. All the Who's were all dreaming, sweet dreams without, without care. He slid down the first chimney, a rather tight pinch. But if Santa could do it, then so could the Grinch. He got stuck only once, for a moment or two. Then he stuck his head out of the fireplace flue, where the little Who stockings all hung in a row. These stockings, he grinned, are the first things to go. <laughs> then he slumped to the ice box. He took the Who's feast. He took the who pudding. He took the roast key like a toy paper. <laughs> <laughs> then he slithered and slunk with a smile most unpleasant around the whole room, and he took every present. Pop guns and bicycles, roller skates, drums, checkerboards, tricycles, popcorn and plums. And he stuffed them in bags. Then the Grinch very nimbly stuffed all the bags one by one up the chimbley. It rhymes. <laughs> Then he slumped to the ice box. He took the Who's feast. He took the Who pudding. He took the roast beast. He cleaned out that ice box as quick as a flash. Why, that Grinch even took their last can of Who hash. Then he stuffed all the food up the chimney with glee. And now, grin the Grinch, I will stuff up the tree. <laughs> Then the Grinch grabbed the tree and he started to shove when he heard a small sound like the coo of a dove. He turned around fast and he saw a small who, little Cindy Lou who, who was not more than two. The Grinch had been caught by this tiny who daughter who got out of her bed for a cup of cold water. She stared at the Grinch and said, Santa Claus, why? Why are you taking our Christmas tree? Why? But you know that old Grinch was so smart and so slick, he thought up a lie and he thought it up quick. Why, my sweet little tot, the fake, fake Santa Claus lied, there's a light on this tree that won't light on one side. So I'm taking it home to my workshop, my dear. I'll fix it up there and I'll bring it back here.
Then the last thing he took was the log for their fire. Then he upped the chimney. He went himself, the old liar. Yes, the mouse is coming up. Yep. There's a tiny mouse here. Anyone see it? Anyone? And the one speck of food that he left in the house was a crumb that was even too small for a mouse. Then he did the same thing to the other whose houses, leaving crumbs much too small for the other whose mouses. It's really mice. Mouse. <laughs> mice. <laughs> it was a quarter past dawn, all the who's still in bed, all the who's still a snooze when he packed up his sled, packed up their presents, the ribbings, the wrappings, the tags, and the tinsel, the trimmings, the trappings. 3,000 feet up, up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip top to dump it. They're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up, I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open for a minute or two. Then the who's down in Whoville will all cry, boo, boo, boo. Or will they? That's a noise grinned the Grinch that I simply must hear. So he paused and the Grinch put his hand to his ear. And he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, the sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so, but it was merry, very. He stared down at Whoville, the Grinch popped his eyes. Then he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch with his Grinch feet, ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew through three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't qu feels quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light, and he brought back the toys and the food for the feast. And he, the Grinch, he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. <laughs> <laughs> For the meditation, I've chosen words by Barbara Pescan, uh, which is in the back of your hymnal, number 506, if you want to follow along. May the glory of the passing away of autumn lie about us fresh as fresh gold for a time. And when the dark comes and the cold, may, me, may we remember how today we stand in glory, how we walk in bounty heaped upon earth's dark carpet, how we move knee deep in abundance flung against night's winter curtain. We are thankful for its coming and for its passing. Let it be. Now is the time in our service when you're invited to express your joys and sorrows, knowing that this is part of our seventh principle, the interdependent web of which we are all a part. Those in Hendricks Hall who wish to do so, please come to the front so we can all hear you. Is there anyone who would like to do that? Uh, in that case, is there anyone on Zoom? I'm not seeing anybody. Okay, all right. So for all the joys and sorrows and concerns that we keep in our hearts, um, let us now observe a moment of silence.
Now please remain seated to uh, sing The Dark of Winter, number 55. for the reflection. And my reflection is called reincarnation from the point of view of a snail. Now this may be a strange topic to discuss right now. Uh, with the winter solstice just four or five days away, along with the holidays which celebrate the coming of light into the dark world. But maybe it isn't. Reincarnation is both a death and a rebirth, isn't it? And in that context, it's found in many cultures and religions. <clears throat> Cambridge Online Dictionary defines re reincarnation as the belief that the spirit of a dead person returns to life in another body or form. Uh, Britannica gives us a broader definition, saying that this rebirth can be consciousness, mind, soul, or some other entity, and that these entities can be human, animal, spiritual, or even vegetable. The belief in reincarnation is found in many South and East Asian religions, such as Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, and Sikhism, as well as in ancient Middle Eastern religions and in ancient Greece. An underlying aspect of all these religions is that of karma, which links one's actions with what will happen to his or her in, in the next existence. In other words, you reap what you sow, or what goes round comes round. And like a steamship reservation for your car, karma is non-transferable. <laughs> so I'd like to tell you a story about a snail. It's called Metempsychosis, or The Journey of the Soul. I found it in a book of short stories written by Margaret Atwood, who is much better known for his, her dystopian novel, The Handmaid's Tale, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, this was, sub I, this was subsequently made into a popular TV series on Hulu. I read the book and then watched the series, which I found very depressing and scary, especially in today's times. But this little story didn't depress me, so I'd like to tell it to you best I, the best I can, putting as much of it as possible into the snail's own words. But Atwood starts the story with her words. They were right about the soul. There is one. Ah. Um, ah. But nothing else we told was we were told was correct. As it turns out, you've probably seen those diagrams. A so-called primitive organism, such as a snail, is shown with a globe of light glowing within it. That globe represents the soul. If the snail behaves well upon its death, the soul is allowed to reincarnate in a supposedly higher organism, such as a fish. Hopping from one organic stepping stone to another, from one rung of the ladder on the great chain of being to another, the soul of that well-behaved snail finally arrives at the pinnacle of creation. And oh joy, 
it is reborn as a human being. <laughs> and, and from now on, we will hear from the snail. Uh, she quotes, so goes the story, but I'm here to tell you that very little about this fantasy is true. I jumped directly from snail to human with no guppies, basking sharks, whales, beetles, turtles, alligators, skunks, mole rats, aardvarks, or elephants in between. I was demolishing a lettuce leaf, my oval, raspy toothed mouth opening and closing as I oozed along in my own slime highway, the lovely green blur all around me, the scent of chlorophyll, the juiciness, it was pure bliss. What happened to me next? Some guy intent on exterminating me got busy with the environmentally friendly pesticide, which was cold coffee in a spray bottle, to which he had added a half a cup, cup of salt. I didn't even have time to retract my stalked eyes or withdraw into my protected, protective carapace. My miniature snail soul shot into the air and made its way through the iridescent rainbow clouds and tinkling bells and straight into the body of a female customer service representative at one of the major banks. How may I, how may I help you, I found myself saying. Needless to say, I felt disembodied, also radically unsuited to the work my human casement had apparently been trained to do answering calls from distraught members of the banking community who claimed to have experienced maltreatment. My human casement had been extensively trained to soothe, to mollify, to reassure. It ran on autopilot like a flesh robot. I pronounced rectify a lot. People don't want to be excused though when they say excuse me. I've learned that. <laughs> they want you to know that they have, that you've been offend, that they have been offended. I'm so sorry, my human mouth kept saying. Now snails don't have any money. They don't need money. Yet there I was, forced to witness these irritating conversations about a subject that I meant I knew nothing about. What was I going to, what, what was I doing in this uncalled for body? What force chained me into this room, to this desk, to this phone? My transition from my snail body had been so rapid, I didn't even know what this new carapace looked like. Of course, I hadn't known what I looked like when I was a snail either. Snails have no interest in mirrors. But at five o'clock, the snail's brain somehow knew that its workday was over. She was working from home because of a virus called COVID, one that snails don't get. The first thing she did was go into the bathroom and here's what happened, back to the snail. Our next act, hour, because you know, the human and the snail together, was to look in the mirror there was a face, a hair fringed face, a face with an ugly protruding nose in the middle of it. I suppose humans could find that appealing. There were no warts on it. I discovered I could make it frown and, and smile. So I put the face through all of its motions. I stuck out its tongue. At last, I thought a body part I could identify with, moist, flexible, retractable, with <laughs> chemical sensors on it very much like a snail, despite its pinkish color. In the bathroom, there was also a tub with a shower. Human bodies are very dry on the outside, lacking that luxurious coating of mucus that renders the bodies of snails so lithe and sinuous. The thought of immersing myself in water was greatly appealing to me, and so she did, until the boyfriend came home. She quickly clambered out of the tub, noticing how strange it was to have two feet while snails have just one, and all that long, wet hair to deal with. After she dried off, she joined the boyfriend for a dinner of ribs, cornbread, coleslaw, and beer, while watching something or other on Netflix. The snail could only eat the slaw and drink the beer. Snails, by the way, love the yeast in beer, but, which smells to them something like fermenting vegetation. But unfortunately, humans often use it to drown snails. Our snail was feeling more and more uncomfortable as the evening wore on to the point where the boyfriend asked, what's wrong, babe? She answered, I don't feel like myself. He then asked, like how? And she answered, there's something wrong with my body. He then remarked, maybe you're coming down with something. 
To which she replied, no, I'm perfectly fine, but this body doesn't feel like mine. I ought to be in a different body. So boyfriend Tyler found his girlfriend a psychiatrist. He was, able, he was able to arrange an appointment for her for two weeks later. At the appointment, the psychiatrist asked what the problem seemed to be. The snail said, I told him I was worried about having a nose. Ah, he said, body dysmor dysmorphia. Have you considered plastic surgery? To which the snail replied, I don't want this body altered. I want it removed. I'm in the wrong body altogether. Ah, the psychiatrist kept saying, until she finally admitted, I'm actually a snail. At which, the, at which point the psychiatrist stopped saying, ah, and just <laughs> stared at her. Then the snail said, I don't think you can help me, and left his office in despair. So our snail then thought that maybe her problem was a religious one. And, started, and she started frequenting churches. She said she liked the churches because they were dim and dampish, like the underside of leaves, and they smelled of mold, which is a smell that she found comforting. She began to pray, oh God, or whoever's responsible for this mess, please get out of here. Let my little soul out of this ungainly giant cage. I don't have to go back to being a snail, though I would prefer that. Maybe a tortoise, a frog, something placid, something vegetarian. <laughs> After two weeks, Amber lost her job in the bank, obviously. <laughs> and um, that was her name, as the snail found out, Amber. And basically just dozed in the apartment's beanbag chair most of the day, spending hours gazing at her hands. She lost weight from eating just lettuce and other greens until one day her boyfriend Tyler found a tiny snail in their salad and flushed it down the toilet. Now, how could Amber live with this, with this murderer? So she left him and spent several hours crouching under a bridge. But since it was October, she ended up in the hospital with hypothermia along with malnutrition and dehydration. Amber ended up returning to the apartment, spending time trying to understand her condition. She thought, perhaps I was a woman to begin with. Maybe even this particular woman, Amber, and I was sent into a snail in order to learn something of deep importance to my soul. But what could that be? What am I missing? Am I what I am? What am I? But then she started to see some upsides to all her suffering. Snails in their own bodies can't see the stars. But through these borrowed eyes, I have seen them now. The stars are magnificent. Perhaps I'll have memories of them when I'm a snail again. If I'm ever permitted that grace, there must be a purpose. I must be learning something. I can't believe all of this is random. I must stay positive until my present host wears out. Then my small, bright, spiral soul will rise and fly through the iridescent, iridescent clouds again to embody itself again, but what? She doesn't know what. Now, I would imagine that most you use don't believe in any kind of life after death, but why not re reincarnation? Perhaps not in the way described in this story, but what about our atoms? Don't they keep on going and probably have been through all of time? Every time we exhale, carbon dioxide and water are released into the atmosphere, and much of that is taken up by the plants, who then release oxygen and more water for us. And who knows what we were before now? Trilobites, fish, ferns, dinosaurs? Weren't we even around at the Big Bang? And won't we still be around for whatever happens at the end of everything in the universe? I'd like to think that. Nigel? <laughs> Um, as we approach the winter solstice and we reflect on rebirth, let us be thankful that we are part of a free congregation, one that embraces many beliefs. In order to keep 
this alive. Please be generous in your giving, either today, here, or on Tithely. Our morning offering will now be received.
Um, for the bless blessing, I've chosen some words by Rabindranath Tagore, uh, number 529 in, uh, in the back of your book. The same stream of life that runs through my veins, night and day, it runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measures. It is the same life that shoots in joy through the dust of the earth in numberless blades of grass and breaks into tumultuous waves of leaves and flowers. It is the same life that is rocked in the ocean cradle of birth and death, in ebb and in flow. I feel my limbs are made glorious by the touch of this world of life, and my pride is from the life throb of ages dancing in my blood this moment. Annie? Um, as Annie extinguishes the chalice, please read along the words in your order of service. Carry, Carry the flame of peace, peace and love until we meet again. Thank you, Nigel and Claire for the wonderful music and Suze for the great poem reading and Deirdre for your tech savvy. It's always great. And the faithful greeters and ushers and coffee hour hosts and contributors. And for all of you who joined us here today at Hendricks Hall or on Zoom, you really make all the difference. So I hope if you're able that you can join us in the back for some coffee and goodies and conversation. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.